72 of Grace and Steel. I'm Kevin Steele. And I'm Kevin Michael Grace. Our show this week is titled, How the World Really Works. It's a consideration of James Burnham's The Machiavellians, and how it relates to the present politics of the world, in America, Canada, and elsewhere. First word about James Burnham. Born in Chicago in 1905 to a prosperous family, he was a graduate of Princeton and Balliol College, Oxford, and became a professor of philosophy at New York University at the age of 24. One of America's leading Trotskyites, and a personal friend of Leon Trotsky himself, Burnham broke with communism after the signing of the Nazi-Soviet Pact in 1939, and became a fierce anti-communist, serving with the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA, during the Second World War. Burnham was one of the founders of William F. Buckley Jr.'s National Review, and was a senior editor there and, arguably, its intellectual leader for a quarter century. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1983 and died in 1987 after having been reconciled to the Catholic Church, just as his hero, Niccolo Machiavelli, had been. One of the 20th century's most profound thinkers, Burnham's fame rests upon three books. The Managerial Revolution, published in 1941, The Machiavellians, published in 1943, and Suicide of the West, published in 1964. The full title of the book we discuss today is The Machiavellians, Defenders of Freedom. By Machiavellians, Burnham refers not to those politicians who seek to employ Machiavelli's political praxis, as outlined in his famous and notorious work, The Prince. Instead, Burnham refers to a school of political scientists who followed and expanded on Machiavelli's political realism. Gaetano Mosca, Georges Sorel, Robert Michels, and Vilfredo Pareto. Burnham argues that the scientific approach to political science pioneered by Machiavelli is far superior to the wishful but cynical thinking extolled by that other great Renaissance Italian, Dante Alighieri. Listeners who have followed this podcast from the beginning will have heard my co-host refer often to the Machiavellians and declare it the work that has most influenced his political thinking. Kevin, what is it about the Machiavellians that so captured your interest and compelled your admiration? Well, originally was that it solved a mystery for me. I've probably told this story before on the podcast, but I'll tell it again, because it is directly relevant to the subject under discussion. In 1968, I met a a now dead Canadian politician called Ray Perot, later became a senator. He was running for the Liberal Party in the federal election of 1968, and he had previously been the leader of the B.C. Liberal Party, and I had admired him for his stand against what I saw of uh, the petty tyranny of the Premier W.A.C. Bennett. I met him uh, while he was campaigning. Uh, he, were, he won in a very narrow uh, race, uh, beating Tommy Douglas, the leader of the NDP party. And then, uh, about a year later, he was speaking at uh, one of these uh, UN generalist, mock UN general assemblies. Mm -hmm. I was involved in that for a couple of years when I went to Argyle High School. And I had uh, doorstopped him after his speech, and I had accused him of falsehood or hypocrisy, because I told him that I admired him for his stand against Uh, W.A.C. Bennett uh, passing legislation by running the legislature 24 hours a day, keeping everyone up all night. But I noted that the first thing that Pierre Trudeau did when he took power in 1968 was to pretty much gut the power of MPs and the ability of the opposition to uh, stymie legislation. In fact, now in Canada, piece of legislation can be passed from beginning to end in about three or four days if the government wishes it so. Now, the response I got from Perot was deeply troubling to me because he looked deeply into my eyes and he said, well, Kevin, what you don't understand is, and then blah, 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 blah. And I, I was taken aback by his confidence the fact that he, he, he didn't see 
any division between the position that he had taken then and the position that he was taking now. I was also rather taken aback by the fact that he knew my name because I thought, well, I talked to him for a few minutes, what, nine months ago or something, but he remembered me and then someone pointed out, you're wearing a name tag, idiot. That's Maybe this has happened to you if you've ever had a name tag all day, you forget that you're wearing a name tag. That's a sitcom this, joke. Yeah, this is how Burnham begins the Machiavellians, because he begins it with a discussion of the Democratic Party platform of 1932, which was committed to balanced budgets and responsible government, and that is to say the, uh, the New Deal, which revolutionized um, America, changed it irrevocably, is nowhere to be found in this rather lengthy document. So the question is, are these people just liars? Are they stupid? And this is what I thought uh, about Ray Perot and what he had said to me. Now, I'd, I thought I'd mention a couple of other examples of political lying of the type engaged in by the Democratic Party in 19. 19- 32. The first would be the Canadian federal election of 1974. That This was the first election that I was eligible to vote in, and I would have voted for Robert Stanfield and the Conservative Party, except that Stanfield advocated a 90-day wage and price freeze. Reading from Wikipedia, Pierre Trudeau, the liberal leader, had ridiculed this policy as an intrusion on the rights of businesses and employees to set or negotiate their own wages and prices with the catchphrase, zap, you're frozen. Now, what I did was I spoiled my ballot. And Trudeau was elected in that election. And guess what? In 1975, he introduced his own anti-inflation board, with wage and price controls. This later affected me directly because I was working at the University of British Columbia and a contract we had just signed was effectively voided by the anti-inflation board of the Trudeau government. My wages were rolled back $75 a month, rather more then than it is now, and this was made retroactive to the beginning of the new union contract So that uh, besides losing the $75, I lost $525 that I'd already paid. And I suppose this is the point at which I began to hate politicians, particularly liberal politicians, with a passion. Second example would be the Canadian Alliance leadership campaign of 2002. Stephen Harper, almost alone amongst the candidates, stood firmly against a merger with the Progressive Conservative Party. Uh, He made this uh, pretty much the basis of his whole campaign. No merger with the Joe Clark Conservatives. Now, shortly after Harper won, he announced uh, that he was seeking a merger with the Progressive Conservatives and this merger was achieved the next year in 2003, and the Canadian Alliance Party, which Harper had sworn to uphold during the campaign and after he won, and I heard his speech the night that he won, uh, the Canadian Alliance was euthanized. My final example is an American one, and it comes from the 1964 presidential election between Lyndon Baines Johnson and Barry Goldwater, and it's expressed in the following famous joke. They told me that if I voted for Goldwater, six months later we would be embroiled in a land war in Asia. Well, I did vote for Goldwater, and guess what? Six months later we were embroiled in a land war in Asia. And this is, this is the crucial thing that I learned from Burnham in the Machiavellians, is to not believe what politicians say. Because there are two meanings. There is a formal meaning 
and there is a real meaning. And politicians almost always speak in terms of formal meanings. Okay, that's a whole section. Purpose of the, of the, the purpose of this, the, the the purpose of this is to legitimize their rule. Uh, I should mention that he explains, uh, you know, Machiavelli's science by contrasting it with a book written by Dante, that other great uh, Italian, De Monarchia, in which he presents a, a rather fabulous view of politics. And Burnham explains that this was really a justification of Dante's own political position, mm-hmm. that uh, this has to do with the the long-running uh, conflict between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines in Europe, and Dante beginning uh, a- as a, f- a member of the Guelph faction, was knocked back and forth, so eventually he became, you know, the bitter ender appealing to the Ghibellines. Uh, Burnham calls him a traitor, in mm. fact. And But he never once so, went back to Florence. Well, no, yeah. he, he had his revenge, you see, mm. because uh, all of his enemies he put in hell. Yeah, <laughs> I know. In the Inferno. Right. Well, yeah, that, which is, you know, that's part one of the book. pretty neat yeah. revenge. Yeah, but it's part one of the book, Dante, Politics as Wish. And this is really, as you, as I said uh, earlier in the introduction, this is what he's contrasting it against, reality versus wish. I just want to interject here, you know, because we have in the past talked about us betting on various outcomes of elections. I would think that after reading this book, you would win every bet, but you told me that you didn't win every bet uh, following elections. So No, I'm very, I'm very bad at mm-hmm. uh, uh, political predictions because there, there's too many short-term variables involved. Right, I suppose, yeah. The, re- the reason I got Donald Trump's triumph correct was because I could see that uh, this wasn't a, a short-term issue. It was a long-term issue. Right. That it was a reaction to the critical failure of the American elite. Oh, okay. And the Western elite in general. Why is this book important? Why should anyone continue to listen to the rest of this podcast, which is going to be uh, a little academic, try to keep it as popular as possible, that Machiavelli, and this is why he was thought so wicked, why his book was put on the index of prohibited works by the Catholic Church, why he... uh, the nickname for the devil, Old Nick, comes from him, that he is uh, routinely berated as an immoralist, is because he describes politics as a struggle for power among men. That's what it is. Yeah, that's all it's it is. It's not about ideas. It's not about ideas. It's not about goodness. It's not about morals. It's about power. Pure and simple. Now, Machiavelli uh, made the point that the only thing that can restrain power is power. Mm -hmm. What we have seen throughout history is a ruling elite uh, which becomes subverted by new forces, new blood, or is supplanted by an alternative elite. And the reason why this book is so important is because since 1945, there has only been one elite, and it it has become more, more and more closed off to, well, to basic reality, in fact. Ah, but if you follow this book, you could also say it's also been closed off to renewal, as well. Yes, to renewal, yeah. yes, definitely. It does not to allow renewal. for the circulation of uh, people between classes. And this, according to this book, is, uh, well, I think it's actually vital to uh, Pareto, the circulation of the uh, elites, allowing uh, people to rise and fall, and that allows the renewal of the ruling class or the elites. So they, he, yes. yeah, he, he, he basically, yeah, he is using, uh, sorry, Pareto to illustrate that rather than make us read Pareto's 3000 page book. Now, uh, Burnham warned against what he called democratic totalitarianism. 
Mm -hmm. where the government gets stronger and stronger, supposedly in the name of the people, but advocates the suppression of the specific institutions and the specific rights and freedoms that still protect the individual from the advance of the unbridled state. Mm -hmm. And that which he has just described here is absolutely out of control in the West. You're talking about the democratic totalitarianism. Well, yes. Yeah, okay. And they, the suppression of specific is, institu yeah. institutions and specific yeah. rights and freedoms. Mm -hmm. that we see this in Canada with this M103. Oh, no, it's just an effort of goodwill. Yeah. Oh, it's an effort of goodwill to identify this phantasm called Islamophobia and to take steps to crush it and to, to crush uh, all such uh, you know bad bigotry. Mm -hmm. Well, the claim, of course, is it's an effort of goodwill on behalf of the people that's the assumption that they make and that's what makes it or turns it into this democratic totalitarianism or bonapartism uh, is another term that they use well yes yeah, so, but yeah. bonaparte the 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 book is very relevant because uh, there is this question of whether in every advanced nation we observe the evolution of the form of government wherein a small group of leaders or a single leader claims to represent and speak for the whole people now, Trump can be seen quite reasonably as a as a Bonapartist. Yeah, that's one thing I picked. But up. but but I would argue that uh, the elite brought this on themselves mm. because they did not allow any forms of alternative power. Right. And this this brings us to this question of people's disappointment in various cabinet picks by Trump advisors that well these people seem to be part of the elite well there's a reason for that because there's a certain group of people who are capable of running things and we call them the elite mm -hmm. yeah so they are by necessity insiders i just want to point out though when we're talking about this uh, democratic totalitarianism and bonapartism he's writing this book in roosevelt's time and he's seen, well, yeah, more right, specifically yeah. during the Second World War. Right, yeah. but Which Roosevelt is, you know, a, a great crisis of uh, civilization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Roosevelt uh, is the example that he's using. And he's saying at that time, 1943, when this book is published, he's saying that this democratic totalitarianism is in some ways sort of the end game of the democratic ideal in some ways, based on the way he's laid it out, because he does talk about this sort of at the end of the book. If we're assuming that politics ends at the end of the Second World War, then, it, you know, this whole idea of the Bonapartist uh, kind of gets solidified and stays in place until, I suppose, the elite get challenged uh, by Trump. Am I correct in that? Or? Well, yes. Uh, he had, uh, Burnham wrote a much more famous book called The, the Managerial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And which he described in another way, more specifically, how, how the world works. That it has been taken over by managerialists. Mm -hmm. Now, th this is something that uh, when he discusses uh, Robert Michel's and his iron law of oligarchy, if bureaucracy happens, power rises, power corrupts. Mm -hmm. I should explain this iron law of oligarchy. Oligarchy means rule by the few or an elite. As uh, Michels explains it, these phenomena would seem to prove beyond dispute that society cannot exist without a dominant or political class, and that the ruling class, while its elements are subject to a frequent partial renewal, nevertheless constitutes the only factor of sufficiently durable efficacy in the history of human development. According to this view, the government, or if the phrase be preferred, the state, cannot be anything other than the organization of a minority. It is the aim of this minority to impose upon the rest of society a legal order, which is the outcome of the exigencies of dominion and of the exploitation of the mass of helots affected by the ruling minority, and can never be truly representative of the majority. The majority is thus permanently incapable of self-government. The majority of human beings in a condition of eternal tutelage are predestined by tragic necessity 
to submit to the dominion of a small minority and must be content to constitute the pedestal of an oligarchy, unquote. Now, we see the, uh, the iron law of oligarchy with regard to the uh, tremendous trouble that Donald Trump is having with his uh, bureaucracy. Donald Trump is the popularly elected president of the United States, but here we see that the, the deep state, uh, the oligarchy, is determined to frustrate his every endeavor, increasingly it seems, by any means possible. And amazingly, the left has taken the position that this unelected deep state, uh, and, well, it's, and as well as a soi-disant uh, right-winger like Bill Kristol, mm-hmm. oh, no, we, we have to let. We have to let the deep state uh, rule because the, the alternative is Trump. Now, right. Burnham uh, notes that hypocrisy is very strong in the Anglo-Saxon world. That for this notion of democracy, for instance, democracy means the kratos, the power of the demos. And where do we see that? I mean, it's almost hilarious for people to speak of democracy. I mean, democracy is a system, a praxis, but it at root, it means the power of the people. Where do we see that now? Mm-hmm. I'm not seeing it. Uh, if it were up to the people of Canada in any kind of fair fight, the people of Canada would say, you know what? Islamophobia is not going to be a problem because we don't want Muslims in Canada. Yeah, but they are not, uh, they're not allowed that voice. They're not allowed that voice by referendum. They're not allowed that voice by even choice of political party. I mean, it's we, we've done a program on the UNI party here. Canada sits in that unenviable position of really not having an opposition and that is the defender of liberty is the opposition the ability to have an opposition that is a true opposition that opposes the ideas of the ruling elite uh, that is the guarantor of liberty or freedom as he defines it in this book and now what that is uh, just as an aside put in here he gives a very good and lengthy definition of why uh, liberty and freedom are good a uh, whole chapter on that and definitely worth quoting at length, but uh, that's an aside. Canada, you know, we are without an opposition, so we have a ruling elite, but without the uh, the guarantors of liberty. Well, uh, Mosca in the ruling class speaks of the ruling class in the ruled. Now, this would seem now to be uh, a truism to me, but this is still a scandalous notion because apparently, you know, the people are in charge of their own destiny. These are the sorts of things we hear during elections. The people are not in charge of their own destiny because mm-hmm. uh, unless you're talking about, oh, I don't know, a, a Vermont hamlet, the conditions for a pure democracy cannot exist. Mm. And Mosca talks about an organized minority imposing its will. Sure. This is the situation that we have, but I mean, you know, as I say, it's particularly dangerous now. You know, look, look at the situation in Germany with this lunatic decision to take in, what, one million refugees or migrants, whatever you want to call them, overwhelmingly Muslim at a stroke. Oh, well, originally there were going to be many, many more Muslims. Now, this is not the kind of decision that a sane elite would make. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah, unless they had goals that they're not expressing. I mean, that is part of the uh, the thing in here. What are the, what are the ruling class goals here in doing this? They must have some goal. It may not be the, uh, the good of the people that they're ruling currently. Maybe it's the good of the people that they would prefer to rule. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. Mm. I, I mean, it is often a mistake, as, uh, as Burnham points out, to look for intelligence in the oh, decision yeah. of rulers. Logic as well, yeah. That's, those were great distinctions in this book, that whole section on uh, how much non-logic plays into human society. Even though, you know, he's advocating the scientific approach of uh, Machiavelli and this school of Machiavellians, 
a big part of what they talk about is the uh, the non logic of uh, so many human interactions. So that kind of makes it difficult. Now, I suspect that they're doing this because they want to feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. This is my considered opinion. I mean, it, it sounds preposterous, but what other possible explanation could there be? I mean, they have gone. They have gone to considerable lengths mm. to suppress the truth about the effects of this migration that we that are already evident. Right, but in one sense, that could be just a reaction to their own uh, stupidity as well, right? I mean, you say they want to feel good about themselves. Okay, that's great. But the real goal here is to maintain and increase power. As soon as uh, Merkel sees that this is going to weaken her or possibly uh, force her to give up power, she starts backtracking, making changes. She is doing that right now, so obviously it's the exercise of power. So. Mm, yes, but to see, that the difficulty is, is that one would expect the Social Democratic Party to take advantage uh, of Merkel's astounding blunder. Mm -hmm. Instead, they are completely on board. Right, yeah. They are all the same. Essentially, the differences between the different political parties in the West are cosmetic mm -hmm. at best. To point out again how important uh, this book is, I'm going to quote from the chapter Machiavelli's Conception of History. Political life, according to Machiavelli, is never static, but in continual change. There is no way of avoiding this change. Any idea of a perfect state or even a reasonably good state much short of perfection that could last indefinitely, is an illusion. The process of change is repetitive and roughly cyclical. What we've seen since 1945 is that politics have been banished. We all believe in, oh, liberal democracy, democratic capitalism, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call okay. about it. And of course, there was a famous notorious book written at the end of the Cold War, actually called The End of History by Francis Fukuyama. And that, oh, we had reached the Omega Point. Mm -hmm. That perfection, or however close we could get to it, had been achieved. I would call and that wishful what we've thinking. Seen, well, definitely wishful thinking. But our rulers, Trump being a, an exception or a possible exception, absolutely believe this. Mm -hmm. the, the near catastrophe of 2007 to 2008 taught them nothing. Mm -hmm. What they took from that is we need the same, only more so. In fact, this is what our elite believes to be the answer to all the problems that we face. The same, only more so. Yeah, well, this, this goes to, I guess, um, the closed-off elite. I mean, they, they seem lacking in ideas. And so getting back to the circulation problem, the fact that, you know, people can't rise and circulate and the elite is not renewing itself. I mean, this is, this is why they end up with such short-sighted uh, solutions. They have no other because they're not really inviting ideas in. But where are the ideas going to come from? This is, this is the crux of the problem. Burnham said that the, the masses do not think about politics. They may think that they do, but generally they don't. And uh, Mosca writes, the other error typical of democratic theory is that the masses, the majority, can rule themselves. Now, they can't. They have representatives, which they supposedly choose. But as we have seen, as Mosca describes, that this is not what happens. Mm -hmm. Our rulers are self-selected. That is proved in the book, by the way, actually. That's, uh, that's yes. also what they... And I forget which one of the uh, the four said that. But you say, where is the where are the new ideas going to come from? You know, the when you say there's the elite and there's the masses, I mean, it's not just two strata there. There's all kinds of stuff in between. I mean, th this lack of mobility, I guess, is a problem in that it stifles original thinking. But that doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't ideas bubbling up. So. No, no, no. I, my, my point was, is that it must be an alternative elite mm -hmm. that is going to present these new ideas. And this alternative elite has not been allowed to exist. Right, yeah. 
that, I mean, if you look at the, the same people who were responsible for the economic doctrines that led to the near catastrophe of 2008, did any of those people lose their jobs? No, no. But, I mean, he he provides for that by saying, you know, the change is, uh, you know, revolution, right? It's not necessarily implying that that's a violent, but it is a revolution, right? Well, the revolution is dangerous, mm -hmm. you see, and... To get on to George Sorel, Sorel's uh, book Reflections on Violence argues that um, that violence has a purgative effect, a, a good effect. Mm. But and we can see that by seeing what the alternative is, which is the suppression of violence mm. from the political world. Right. He says. But I mean, uh, Burnham, Bur Burnham writes. Oh. It is true that overt acts of violence have become less frequent than in many former ages. Is this in all respects an improvement? It is to the extent that brutality, such as uses robbers and brigands in earlier times, or by the state in the punishment of criminals, has become rarer. Sorel is careful to explain that by violence he does not mean brutality of this sort. Now, the point is, is that the people who run the show oh, we can't have violence, violence is wicked. This not only protects their corruption, but since they have no fear of violence, it is a very powerful inducement to corruption. And there's no question that our political system is grossly corrupt. I, I will mention in this regard just one thing, the incredible power of public relations agencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, one could argue that Canada is a country ruled by public relations agencies. Everyone who's ever had some role in government, even as a backroom boy, what do they do? They go into PR. What they are doing is selling influence. And incredibly, in my country, the these PR spivs, as Simon Heffer described them, are now coming to dominate political journalism. I mean, you've noticed this, right? Yeah, we've discussed this in the past. Yeah, they are. But that's just one way that they propagandize, right? That's just one way. That's one outlet for them. But I just want to take it back a second to when we were talking about violence. The reason I had brought that up initially was because we were talking about the circulation in the elites and the in introduction of new ideas. Burnham does talk about the, the fact that if it becomes too bottled up, if it becomes too stagnant, the elite, they tend to screw up at that point. And because they screw up, uh, that's what leads to the revolution or the violence. You know, the fact is that they, they make a mistake and people suffer. And when people suffer, that's when the, the egg gets uh, pushed off the bridge, Humpty Dumpty wise. You know, the elite is shattered and either, you know, the, there will be circulation at that point. Now, whether there's lots of uh, collateral collateral damage, uh, that remains to be seen. You know, well, uh, about, Burnham writes, so. an open recognition of the necessity of violence can reverse the social degeneration. Now, instead, mm. now what we saw, I'll give an example from Britain when Tony Blair was prime minister. There were huge rallies. People came from all over the island to descend on London, to, uh, about five. 500,000, 600,000 people against the invasion of Iraq and against the banning of blood sports. Now, the reaction of the elite was, yeah, so what are they going to do about it? Like, we don't care. We literally don't care. Mm. And the suggestion was that, well, what are they going to do? Storm Parliament? Because apparently that's what it would take mm -hmm. to make a change. And you can see how dangerous a situation that is. That's true, yeah. Yeah, he does at that point, 1943, Burnham talks about the rise of the soldier as well into the political class. And uh, I think, well, we see that some of that with Trump, of course, with his appointing of so many soldiers into his cabinet. I don't know whether he would anticipate... Or would you see some of that before Trump, I suppose? There was some. I mean, Eisenhower, obviously, was the absolute fulfillment of that prediction 
that suggests, I guess, a certain political consciousness on behalf of the uh, the force in society, the ultimate force. Well, you saw, if you saw uh, Trump's State of the Union mm. address, yep. you notice how closely he identified himself with the military, and I don't believe this was an accident. Right. Because there is a, there seems to be an ongoing threat of a civil, some sort of civil war in the United States, because the left not my president. Mm -hmm. They lost fair and square in an election, and they won't surrender power. Oh, they think they're surrendering power. Um, yeah, but they have, th they, yeah, they have, I guess, bandied about the idea in, certainly columnists have, the, the idea of a coup. The tamer version is, of course, impeachment. But yeah, they are talking about some kind of drastic change of government here, which uh, what would, would have to be met with force, wouldn't it? I'm not sure. Will it have to be met with force, some sort of force? Well, I think that Trump is sending a message to his opponents. That, you know, there's all this talk of a coup d'etat, mm -hmm. you know, of him being ousted from power right, yeah. oh, and of dying in prison, you know. And I, I think that Trump is sending a very powerful message that, you know, going back to Machiavelli, mm -hmm. that if he has the soldiers on his side, how can his enemies prevail? That's right, yeah. Well, that's the, uh, I guess, the Machiavellian rules. The first one is that, you know, power is the goal of all politics. And maintaining that power is, uh, is force. Nothing else. Yes, force. Yeah. Nothing else. Now, with Sorel, you have this fascinating idea of the power of political myth. Hmm. I don't mean myth in the sense of falsehood, but I mean in a great idea. Now, Sorel talked about the general strike. Sorel was a, a syndicalist, a uh, radical adherent in, uh, of union power. Mm. But the, the great strength of the myth is that it cannot be refuted. Right. Now, a tremendous example is make America great again. Now, this is a very powerful notion. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. It's rather obscure, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, that is the myth, but there are certain goals that are attainable that uh, fit within, I guess, the Machiavellian purview. I don't know what you call it. Well, you know? there, are, there are certain goals, and Trump in his State yeah. of the Union address, he mentioned many of them. Right. Well, But the idea of make America great again is one which inspires people. And right. it, it is the myth that creates political success or alternately a poor myth mm -hmm. leads to political failure. If you look at Canada's myth, it seems to be that we're the best country in the world. Can you think of an alternative myth? No, that's the one. Since, yeah. uh, for, well, for instance, because we're the best country in the world, we have to let in all these refugees. Mm -hmm. Because what would the best country of the world do? Right. Make itself worse by inviting everyone to come in. Plus invade the world, too. So uh, we've got that going for us, unfortunately. Well, you see that this idea, this idea of America as a shining city on a hill, as Ronald Reagan described it, the, the neocons hijacked this. Mm -hmm. And it led to regime change. And as far as I can see, there is now no more appetite for that in the United States. Yeah, I think that that comes about, though, because of the lack of success, I would say. They have not achieved making America great again through the, uh, the application of the neocon philosophy, I suppose. You know, it, it really has not, it not ha hasn't raised the fortunes of the masses, I would say, so... I suppose that the internal myth of our rulers is largely this idea of meritocracy, mm -hmm. that the best people rise to the top. Well, it's a tautology, is it? Isn't it? Right, yeah. How do you know that they're the best people? Well, because they rose to the top. Now, what is common to the people in our meritocracy is that they all believe the same things. In other words, merit is defined as believing the set of uh, beliefs defined by the ruling class. Okay. Oh, for instance, that we're all the same under the skin. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, a, again, an utterly preposterous notion. 
I th- but our uh, meritocracy believes it. Mm-hmm. It's a myth, I suppose. It would be a myth along the same lines as Make America Great Again in a way. Eh? But the the idea of constitutions, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, that type of thing, these are all part, I guess, of those those myths as well. There is a nice breakdown in the book. Well, you're so, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I was going to say that you can see how the consti- there's been an attempt to make the Constitution into a myth. Mm-hmm. And it it's failed. And we saw that in the last election. Right, yeah. Whereas the, the Republicans uh, opposed to Trump, the Constitution, Constitution, Constitution. Oh, you mean that document that means whatever the Supreme Court says that it does? Right. I mean, this proved unavailing. Yeah, but I think that there is something, there's a nice part in the book that I confess, you know, because while you were, you've been familiar with this a long time and I've just read it, the part that I would like to go over again is that part about uh, residue and derivatives. Uh, residue. That's Pareto. Pareto, yeah. Because, you know, I mean, really residue, I guess you would call it core truths or more enduring truths and derivatives are the things that, you know, are kind of slapped on top of that and they vary. They float about in the wind, and he actually puts uh, things like the Constitution into the derivatives, you know, outside of the the uh, residue, outside of the core truths. So no, the core the core truth of the United States is this is the land that a certain people made. Mm-hmm. That's the core truth of the United States. All of the oh, America has always been a country of immigrants, or oh, anyone who believes that they are American or really American or that uh, gibberish that's been affixed to the Statue of Liberty. Yes. Mm. These, are, these, these are all residues. Yeah. I, I like that, actually. I, it, derivatives, you mean, I think is what it was. Not residues. Residues are the, the sorry. hard truths. Yes, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so you just reverse it. Not a problem. But uh, yeah. that part, I think, deserves more study on, on my uh, part because it was really hard to wrap my head around this idea that, you know, what I was brought up to believe that these core docu- doctrines are kind of at the heart of the nation and he's being dismissive of them in a way in the same way that uh, you know he, he includes religion in a lot of examples as well he gets very dismissive of certain doctrines in religion as well and calls them derivatives as well so i guess well i mean there's a there's an alternative history of the united states mm-hmm. expressed by charles beard and others that uh, The Glorious Revolution was largely a power grab. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, well, it was literally a property grab in many cases. I mean, there's people who, uh, the United Empire loyalists who fled to Canada, well, they left their property behind, didn't they? In the same Mm -hmm. way that it has been argued by many that uh, Britain's so-called Glorious Revolution was just a cynical power grab. That if if the Catholics are robbed of their property and of the aristocrats who were not on board uh, with this big, bold state power, if they lose their property, well, there's a lot more property than for the people on the winning side. Yeah, but I mean, it's, you know, I'd be careful in calling it cynical because the uh, the opposite, well, I mean, what he's really defining is this is what all these fights are about. They are about power. They are about taking stuff, and that's what a revolution. That's what happens in a revolution. Nothing else happens. So to say it's cynical is to say you know the other side is wishful thinking. Well, no, thinking. I probably, oh, okay, yeah. sure, but I, I would I would suggest that the the myths mm. that have arisen about the origins of especially the so called glorious revolution are, are cynical. Yeah. Now I mean in any vast change such as the american revolution you're going to have a a mixture of idealism and shall we call it practicality certainly yeah and actually that was i guess one of the more interesting parts of the book that the fact that he goes into talking about the necessity like he's not dismissive of myths and he's not dismissive of these derivatives at all they're absolutely necessary in communicating with the masses who you rely on for your legitimacy in power so these things have a function. They're not useless or they're not, they're not lies, necessarily. They have a function. Even if they are lies, they have a function in communicating with the masses. So I think that that, 
that has to be put in there as well. You know, we're not, I'm not being completely dismissive of, say, the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, just because, you know, it's not what they define in this, or what Burnham defines in this book as a residue. I just want to make that clear. I mean, that's the interesting, neat little distinctions there, I suppose. Well, let's uh, look at uh, what Burnham writes at the end of the book, where he is uh, consolidating and, and synthesizing mm -hmm. all these okay. thinkers. And he talks about the, the conditions under which a rapid shift takes place. Okay. The principle of these conditions are the following. One, when the institutional structure and the elite which has the ruling position within this structure are unable to handle possibilities opened up by technological advances and by the growth, for whatever reason, of new social forces. Ah, yeah. Two, mm -hmm. when a considerable percentage of the ruling class devotes little attention to the business of ruling and turns its interest to such fields as culture, art, philosophy, and the pursuit of sensuous pleasure. Three, when an elite is unable or unwilling to assimilate rising new elements from the masses or from its own lower ranks. Mm -hmm. Four, when large sections of the elite lose confidence in themselves and the legitimacy of their own rule, and when in both elite and non-elite there is a loss of faith in the political formulas and myths that have held the social structure together. Five, when the ruling class, or much of it, is unable or unwilling to use force in a firm and determined way, and instead tries to rely almost exclusively on manipulation, compromise, deceit, and fraud. These are the general preconditions of social revolution in any culture. They characterize the age just ending, as the modern Machiavellians understood. Now, I think it's arguable that all five of these conditions exist in the West. Mm -hmm. I agree, actually. And I, uh, as you were reading there, I had just had a thought. I'm going to drag you aside here for a, sec a second. Uh, you know, you've heard about this travel to the moon, these private... Uh, Elon private Musk? Yeah. Would you say that that is uh, the elite indulging in sensuous pleasure? Because it does not... It's for their own benefit. It's just... Uh, I kind of that's what I kind of thought when uh, you were you were talking about their indulging in art and well, and sensuous pleasure. It, it's possible. Mm -hmm. It's possible. I, I don't know. It, it seems, you know, to be perhaps an alternative to uh, you know the construction of a, a pyramid mm -hmm. as a burial chamber. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just the reason it popped into my head, of course, is, you know. We grew up hearing, well, they can put a man on the moon. Why can't they fix the roads? You know, that kind of thing. Now, let's consider number five with regard to the United States or with regard to, say, Germany or especially France. When the ruling class or much of it is unable or unwilling to use force in a firm and determined way and instead tries to rely almost exclusively on manipulation, compromise, deceit, and fraud. After Trump's State of the Union address... Oh, there he goes on about rising crime. Mm -hmm. Oh, crime isn't rising? You see, and we wouldn't want to deal with crime by the use of force. No, let's see if we can buy these people off somehow. I'm, I'm referring to black rioters in the United mm -hmm. States, and there's just sort of the the orgy of, of black violence that, that characterizes the so-called inner city. Right. We can see with the Muslims in, in France that there is some low-level version of a civil war already going on in France. But, oh, well, you know, how many cars were burned tonight? Not too bad, you know, mm -hmm. could be worse. Now, when, when do the soldiers in the street get the order to shoot? I mean, we see them standing around with guns. Uh, obviously, they are a show of force. Are they? Well, I don't see that. I don't think they would ever get the order because th this would be the elite killing the people that they love the best. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, you you see, you, you note the way that, you know, for instance, until Jason Kenney decided to run for the conservative leadership, you never saw him photographed with white people. It was, you know, he demonstrated again and again mm -hmm. that it was these immigrants, these outsiders, um, who were closest to his heart. Right. I mean, th this idea, th this xenophilia which has corrupted the elite, there seems to be no end to it. Yeah, but again, you know, like Merkel, 
they get brought back to reality by the threat to their primary directive, which is the maintenance of power. You know, they're going to have to bring in an awful lot of people in order to tip the balance in favor of uh, the the Vismins that uh, Kenny is photographed with. And this, of course, was, you know, people talked about the end of identity politics with Trump after that speech. But uh, really, it was just the beginning. It's just that the majority decided to play identity politics. They haven't come around to that in Canada yet. Well, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, Martin Schultz, the leader of the Social Democratic Party, has apparently suggested that non-citizens be given the right to vote mm -hmm. in German elections. Right. That would be now. Uh, I, I think it was uh, Martin Armstrong who suggested that this would lead to civil war right. in Germany. But these these kinds of the, the kinds of things that happen, you know, that uh, California has a severe water crisis and oh we're just going to invite more and more people here illegals here because well what could go wrong with that because that our myth that the myth that we are good people because we do things that are very much not in our interests or certainly not in the uh, the general interest mm -hmm. i have no answer for that other than you know going back to the non-logical uh, aspects of human behavior that are mentioned in this book and uh, possibly the the idea of the myth that they're serving uh, as well. It has served them well. You know, we have the conservatives Up until this point in history, the myth uh, that they are good people has served them well because most people have signed on to it, right? I mean, there's signs of desperation now that the identity of politics are breaking uh, even into the white society. But they're, the pushback there is pretty hard. You know, all the PR spivs are working pretty hard on that. Ad agencies, everybody, right? Well, I, it's as, as I say, it is... The, the elites have lost their elan. Mm -hmm. I, and they don't... I mean, this is always the case to a certain degree. But their motivating principle seems to have been reduced entirely to we're here because we're here because we're here. Right. I mean, are you going to let that maniac take over? Now, Burnham writes, Bonapartist theory can plausibly claim to be the logical as well as the historical culmination of the democratic formula, just as the plebiscite can claim to be the most perfect form of democratic suffrage. The Bonapartist leader can regard himself and be regarded as the quintessential democrat. His despotism is simply the omnipotent people ruling and disciplining themselves. Hmm. This is just what the Bonapartist leaders themselves and their spokesmen argue. When democracy is defined in terms of self-government, there can be no convincing democratic answer. Now, I, I mean, uh, Vladimir Putin would seem to be a Bonapartist hmm. by this definition. And if the, if the politics of the United States are going to continue to become more fractious and anarchic, I would argue that there would seem to be a little alternative but Bonapartism. What do you think? Uh, yeah, well, I think we're there already, and uh, this is a reaction. I mean, uh, considering when this book was written, you know, looking at the beginning of the book with the Democratic platform, and obviously, you know, he's referring to someone like Roosevelt in the midst of a war when he's talking about Bonapartism. I would say that we're there now. And what's happened, I guess, is, you know, we, we have a Bonaparte without a convincing elite along with him. That's all. He's trying to put together a convincing elite. Well, no, I, I was greatly amused. It was in some, I think it could have been uh, in the New Republic, uh, which years ago had interesting things in it, interesting and useful things, and now is now complete drivel. That you see that Trump... Had, that there has failed to coalesce a, how would you say, a, a Trumpist intellectualism. Hmm. I think, how long has he been president now? Yeah, I know. How, how long do you think this sort of thing takes? <laughs> it is, yeah, really, you guys were dismissing him right up to November 8th. So it is kind of amazing how he is uh, assumed to have uh, not changed the world in a month, but let, let's give it a little time. How much time? I don't know. Um, Anyways. Now, I, I just w wanted to say, you know, in terms of the crisis that we're in, that this is something to, 
to ponder this paragraph. Only power restrains power. That restraining power is expressed in the existence and activity of oppositions. Mm. Oddly and fortunately, it is observable that the remaining influence of an opposition much exceeds its apparent strength. As anyone with experience in any organization knows, even a small opposition, provided it really exists and is active, can block to a remarkable degree the excesses of the leadership. But when all opposition is destroyed, there is no longer any limit to what power may do. A despotism, any kind of despotism, can be benevolent only by accident. I like now, that line, yeah. This is the situation that we have in Canada, where, oh, boo, Justin Trudeau, the shiny pony. Uh, well, what are you offering hmm. instead? Uh, pretty much the same as uh, what he's offering, but we don't have a young, handsome, spo ha handsome spokesman. Still a pony, just a duller pony. Yes. I know that is what we are facing. The, the, the rush so. with which the conservatives met the totalitarian threat of M103 by saying, we are all on board with a slightly different version of M103. Uh, it doesn't contain the word Islamophobia, but the assertion that Canada is racist and that racism is a great evil that must be reduced and even eliminated, oh, well, we're on board with that. Yeah, that's not really an opposition at all, is it? No. I know, so there's no check on power here. It's interesting, you know, Donald Trump made his uh, speech before Congress, and there was one, I think it was Roger Simon wrote a column saying, is this the end of the Democratic Party? I mean, this was just as I'm reading this portion in the book, and I'm thinking, you know, well, I don't think the U.S. will survive very well without an opposition, so perhaps the Democratic Party better get its stuff together. <laughs> Form an opposition. Well, there is there is the possibility, you know, that a President Trump, seeing how weak the opposition is, could be much bolder than it would seem he intends to be. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it was a big. The speech before Congress was, I guess, a lot of people saw it as a softening and a plea for bipartisanship. But I think it was J Five Killer on Twitter said he's the most Machiavellian president I've known. And uh, I'm thinking, okay, so if that is the case, what is the purpose of this softening tone? You know, what is, how does that Well, no, on? I mean, you see, he was appealing to blacks and Hispanics very strongly, mm -hmm. appealing to veterans very strongly, this idea that we're all in it together. Right. I will repeat my assertion that Donald Trump is a liberal. Okay. And is perhaps the last hope of liberalism. In Bonapartist form. Or in democratic totalitarian uh, well, form. Uh, well, he's mildly Bonapartist now. He could mm. become much more Bonapartist, as I say, if the if the opposition, la résistance, is idiotic enough to attempt uh, some sort of insurrection. Mm -hmm. Then I suspect that um, he just you know might move directly into the uh, Vladimir Putin hardman mode. Right. Yeah. They certainly would have the uh, the democratic support for that, I think. Anyway, I mean that's that's something that does get pointed out in here. You know that there are all kinds of uh, democratically elected leaders, even Hitler's, in the get elected democratically. So, uh, oh sure, yeah, you know. sure. I but I should have mentioned this before. But you know, if you read this book, I think you'd have to be persuaded that popularism in its pure form, this idea of bottom-up populism is simply not possible. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, people, yeah. people say that uh, Donald Trump is a populist. People say that Kelly Leach is a populist. But this is tough from the top down, as I think it only can be. Well, that's what's argued very strongly in this book, yes. Yeah, it, it can't happen the other way. You know, there is an elite by necessity, because that's the only way it can function. Organizations I mean, when, when, Pre when Preston Manning was leader of the Reform Party in the early days, did this idea that MPs had to vote according to the wishes of their constituents. Of course, that leads to a very serious um, epistemological problem. 
Mm-hmm. What are the wishes of my constituents and how would I discover them? What? Are you going to have referendums for every single vote a politician makes? The, the idea is unworkable, absurd even. And darn annoying for those who simply want to delegate, which is the mass of people. They want to get on with their lives and do other things. If they were concerned with power, they would be involved in politics. They are quite happy to delegate this. And, you know, the people that take it up, of course, become the elite. Well, if well, that people, is they you know, allowed People to vote for certain politicians for all sorts of reasons, but the mm. idea that they, um, they all download the position papers mm-hmm. on the party website and study them intently right. and have, um, you know, serious conversations with their family, friends, and neighbors about this. Right. Look, even people involved in politics don't do that <laughs> because it is, it is an unspoken secret that these policy positions or platforms are all, as Burnham would say, formal in meaning. Right. You're going to get into a description of that? I'll leave that to people who read the book, I suppose. Well, no, that, that, that formal as opposed to actual. Right, yeah, okay. Okay. You know, it, it's, you know, in the same way that um, someone says good morning. Well, perhaps it isn't a particular, this is a particularly good morning. Mm-hmm. You know, sort of compliments that uh, people make. They're, they're formal statements. There's all manner of formal statements. We're all familiar with them. They have a, a societal function. They are not related to what uh, Burnham calls the world of reality of time and space. Mm. Okay. Can I cast you back in time just a little bit? And uh, Because one of the th- things I had, I had no trouble applying this book to the present. That's what I really enjoyed about it. In fact, probably too much because I wasn't really thinking deeply or in terms of long-term Machiavellian- Machiavellianism. How would you categorize a leader like Barack Obama in the terms of this? Was he a total, a democratic totalitarian? Or was he just a Well, a that was figurehead? a function of his government. No, mm. he, he was very much a creation of myth. Right. That this magical Negro will heal our divide. Yeah. Yes, without uh, having any uh, tools to really do it. And ended up actually, or or, a, or yeah. any particular interest mm-hmm. in it. I mean, as far as magical Negroes go, um, Barack Obama was a pretty sorry specimen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know whether Oprah is considered magical or not, but uh, she's mulling it over, according to Drudge. You know, so she uh, seems a little more engaged than Barack, does she not? She does. Yeah, yeah. I think she might take a run at it. Who else have the Democrats got? You know, they're in a desperate situation. That speech, that speech before Congress was brilliant. You know, he, he, he walked off with half the Democrats' platform. And the raison d'etre, you know, he, he left them, I guess, you know, kind of stunned. So that they really didn't have a, a whole lot of response. He had Van Jones saying, with that speech, he became the president. So, I mean, what kind of... Well, that's the there? sort of things that, that people like Van Jones says. Sound you know, like, I don't yeah. know whether he, he'll even remember that six months from now on. I suppose he'll be needled with it mm-hmm. forever. You know, but the, you see the uh, Iron Fist Velvet Glove there. This constant talk about immigration lowering wages. That was hammered home masterfully. Mm-hmm. And immigrants... Cre- being responsible for vile attacks on Americans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- th- it was a brilliant speech in that regard. Would you, in the, if he were following Machiavellian principles, as J. Five Killer said in his tweet, what kind of purpose would he have this softening of the tone at this point? Well, to the extent that you Disarming? cannot, to, to the extent that you cannot destroy your enemies, you must conciliate them. Right. That the biggest mistake is to fall between those two stools. Okay. You see that uh, Trump has this uh, black people are, are an intractable opposition mm-hmm. to Trump. But you see his efforts to, to conciliate them, to bring him on board in a way that has never been done by previous Republican presidents. So, you know, going on about the tax code or enterprise zones. 
Right. This this idea of appealing to their patriotism <laughs> apparently never occurred to these uh, Republican geniuses of the past. No, nor the Democrats, mind you. You know, so I just I wanted I wanted to sum up certainly our, our discussion. I'm, okay, and I'm going to read again from uh, Burnham's chapter Politics on Truth. That this is why at the end, yeah, this book is so important because. Quote, the Machiavellians are the only ones who have told us the full truth about power. Other writers have at most told the truth only about groups other than the ones for which themselves speak. The Machiavellians present the complete record. The primary object in practice of all rulers is to serve their own interest to maintain their own power and privilege. There are no exceptions. No theory, no promises, no morality. No amount of goodwill, no religion will restrain power. Neither priests nor soldiers, neither labor leaders nor businessmen, neither bureaucrats nor feudal lords will differ from each other in the basic use with which they seek to make of power. Individual saints, exempt in individual intention from the law of power, will nevertheless be always bound to it through the disciples, associates, and followers to whom they cannot, in organized social life, avoid being tied. So that's the point, is that Machi Machiavellianism leads to the truth. And I, I believe we're both on board with the idea that uh, truth is superior to falsehood. Certainly, if your goal is understanding. <laughs> and I think that was the goal in trying to... Uh... To, in doing this show, you know, trying to understand uh, the political world or political man and uh, make some sense of what is uh, not what's going to happen necessarily, but at least what is happening. So what are the well, challenges? Well, I, I would just, I would just, you know, a prediction for the future is that the elite in the Western world had better get some fresh blood, mm. some new ideas, and to stop trying to, you know, force everyone to bake the cake. Right. And if they do not, I suspect that they will be swept from the pages of history and rather violently. Yeah, I think it was the intractableness of those types of policies that, you know, of course, led to the rise of Trump, right? People saw this strangling of, of opinion and of, uh, of their options. They saw that's why they rejected the establishment uh, Republicans and will probably re keep rejecting them. And I suspect that with that speech that before Congress, Trump has won over a lot of Democrats that are fed up with the restraints put on them by the Democratic Party. We should yeah. conclude by noting uh, something which is uh, rather embarrassing. So, yes, this book, The Machiavellians by James Burnham, mm. you should all run out and buy a copy. Yeah, well, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at Amazon. Hardcover from $198.99, paperback from $118.89, hmm. audio CD, strangely, from 1687. I bought my book, I believe, through uh, Abe Books or at Libris, uh, one of those. Uh, I bought it about 10 years ago mm -hmm. for $25, uh, the hardcover. I think it's a first edition. Is that what uh, you sent but, me? You sent me a PDF of uh, no. First there, there, there is a there is a PDF that mm. is uh, available on the web, and I, I really must salute you, your dedication here, because I find trying to read PDFs of any length that uh, I get a blinding headache uh, within about three pages. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well. And I had two days to do this, right? Okay. Well, I'll just give you a little secret here. Okay. That yes, there is this. Uh, 1943 first edition available in PDF, where the pages are all wonky. But there's also an audio version available from, I think it's, uh, the book is like 1973 or something like that, and the audio version was 1998. And uh, it's slightly different. You can listen to that audio version while following along. I found that very helpful in, in going through this book in such a short time. And uh, it's not that complicated a read, but there are a lot of terms in there and ideas, I guess, that a person like myself is just not that familiar with. So, it took Well, you know, Samuel Johnson said, uh, free your mind from Kant. Mm -hmm. And this is the challenge of this book. But, but, but 
politicians are all good men striving their best, and it's all about morality, ultimately. Well, mm -hmm. no, it isn't. Right, yeah. I just wanted to add on this book, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to find it in our links or not. The PDF? Yeah. Well, well I, I think we should be able, yeah, I, I think so. And we can, you know, provide links to A Books and A Libris. So oh, for sure, yeah. So find out the used copies that are available. Sure, yeah, if you want to blow a hundred bucks. That's right. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, I do, well, I, I, all right. So I've just done a search on A Books uh, for the Machiavellians. And all right, here's a, a soft cover for $10.32, $12 hardcover, $12.62. hardcover, $12.62. Oh, this is the audio book for $28. Uh, yeah, another audio book. Another audio. Whoa. There don't seem to be. <laughs> oh, wow. Ga the Gateway Editions, which I used to own years ago. Uh, $80. Mm -hmm. yeah. My word. Okay, but there are two uh, for under 15 There you go. So, it's... get them while they last. That's right, yeah. Did you have any other... Uh recommendations or thoughts before we uh, pull a plug? Well, I'll just mention one thing that the, the, the late uh, political theorist uh, Sam Francis, a particular favorite of mine and many others, was tremendously influenced by James Burnham and in fact uh, wrote two books about him, mm -hmm. which you can also look into. Right. I would say, it wasn't it Bannon was uh, referencing, uh, somebody had mentioned that Bannon had referenced Sam Well, Francis. he was referencing James Burnham. Oh, he was certainly. Okay, so yes, he was. New York Times had a had an article. What does Bannon want? Well, he wants power, obviously. If you read this book, <laughs> but uh, that may not be a bad thing for the nation at this particular time. Okay, so we'll call it in now to episode seventy-two of Grace and Steel. I'm Kevin Steele, and I'm Kevin Michael Grace. <laughs> <laughs>